My name is David. This is week 19 of 52 Churches in 52 Weeks. If you're new here, consider liking and subscribing to stay up to date with this intentional church hopping experience. Uh, I also uh, usually put a little Instagram logo in the side here. Uh, if you want to check that out, uh, it has a really nice uh, tally of all the churches uh, with the pictures and then typically a real quick 30 to 1 minute video of how each church worships. So really fun just to see those back to back. For today, uh, it's been raining cats, dogs, horses, cows, roosters, hens, all of Old McDonald's Farm EIEIO. And I uh, want to go further out today, but figure with the weather, uh, I'll just stay kind of close to home. Uh, so I went to Green Bay, Wisconsin, um, Titletown, USA, home of the Packers. Uh, the NFL season kicks off today. I'm going to be checking out my first ever Kingdom Hall um, of Jehovah's Witness uh, type of church service. Um, when it comes to Jehovah's Witnesses, um, I don't have, I only have some brief interactions. And uh, I think I write about this in my book, uh, 52 Churches in 52 Weeks. You can check it out on Amazon. Uh, when I did this seven, eight years ago, I write about um, one, one day I, I had uh, some Jehovah's Witnesses come up to my door. And I answered the door, said hello, was very friendly. And uh, we got to talk a little bit about, you know, God. And at the time I was just, you know, it's like, wow, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, your courage and your faith to be walking door to door. Well, what happened afterwards is I must have gotten on some type of list because all of a sudden, then I started getting more and more and more visits. And it wasn't until one morning where the night before I was working uh, late second shift, so I didn't get I didn't get done with work until like midnight, and I was so tired the next morning. So I was just super groggy. So I remember I had just woken up. I was in my boxers, and I just grabbed some string cheese. Now, quick, with string cheese, the correct way to eat it is, you know, the whole the whole piece. Uh, I know people like rip it up into pieces. That's not the right way to do it. So first off, that's how to eat string cheese, and then secondly. I heard some doors shut outside my house. So, you know, I, I peel through the drapes, kind of see what was going on. And sure enough, uh, it was uh, a couple people coming out of a minivan um, with their Bibles. Um, were dressed very nicely, so I kind of figured it must be Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, they came up to my door. And at the time, like when someone kind of comes up to your house or your driveway, like you get very defensive about it. And I remember that day, because I was so groggy, because I was cranky, because uh, I was so tired from the night before, like the Bible talks about putting on the full armor of God and the breastplate of righteousness. For me that morning, like I was not ready to put on my big boy pajama pants of theology and have a, a debate on my faith, because that's how I interpreted uh, the visit that day. So um, I was just very cranky and kind of looking back at it, I feel kind of bad um, that I had such a negative impression of that day. So for today's visit, and with the 52 churches in 52 weeks, I like to try and defeat previous biases I may have had about denominations or other type of Christian organizations I'm just not fully aware of. So instead, today I'm going to knock on their door, I'm going to walk inside their house and see how they greet me, and I'm sure it's going to be a lot better than how I treated them. Um, well, didn't treat them, but just how I kind of hid away um, when they visited my house uh, before in the past. So gonna go inside, I am running late, so I gotta get inside and uh, we'll share a little bit more in a little bit.
First off, the right way to eat string cheese. Secondly, whoa, this was a very strange service to attend if you're a first time visitor. Um, I thought going in with Jehovah's Witnesses and Kingdom Halls, it was going to be very similar to like typical Christian churches, just with some differences in terms of, okay, you called God Jehovah, or with um, the recruitment would may maybe be a little bit more aggressive with the door-to-door -door sales. No, it wasn't like that at all. Um, I didn't know how much things were different in terms of the significance of prophecies and revelation and dreams and how Jesus is viewed uh, when it comes to Jehovah's Witnesses. So I'm still kind of wrapping my head around everything. With these videos, I don't want to be raining Sodom and Gomorrah on a church body that I don't necessarily agree or align with. Um, so for this video, uh, I think the best way for me to, to present this is just to show the facts, what happened, and also just ask some questions so I can kind of clarify uh, the certain beliefs that happen here. So walking in, uh, the very first thing I had to grab was one of these guys. And, uh, you know, with a lot of the churches I've been attending, uh, unless they, they're very liberal, uh, there hasn't been many churches that have required the masks. Um, here I kind of learned why later on the significance of why I had to put that on. Everyone was very family-like just conversations with everyone. Um, I was probably one of the only outsiders that wasn't speaking with somebody. And uh, this would probably rank as probably the first or second best dressed church I've ever attended. Uh, the men were all in suits, the women were in dresses, heels, jewelry, uh, just dressed to the nines. So service began and they had, uh, there's no cross symbolism or anything like that. The stage looked more kind of like a 80s talk show set um, like Donahue or something like that and they had two big screens to the sides and both the screens read a passage from Psalm 3410 those seeking Jehovah will lack nothing good so a gentleman got up he was visiting from a different kingdom hall he gave about a 30 minute talk I don't remember a whole lot of what he was talking about until they posted this image of this woman riding these beasts with just growling teeth and these horns on their heads. It was so strange to see during a worship service. As he explained, the image was supposed to symbolize Babylon the Great. I guess another term for her is the Whore of Babylon. So this is in reference to Revelation 17 that talks about the Babylon the Great this harlot, this prostitute, wielding these beasts. And the beasts are supposed to symbolize false religion. And with the false religion, they would corrupt political powers, leading to what Revelation, I guess, calls the Eight Kings or the Ten Kings. More on that in a moment. So the gentleman finished up his talk, 30 minutes, and then they were ready to do a hymn. So with the hymn or the song, it was almost military-like. It was like this marching song. Even a, a lady in front of me was kind of doing this. Um, just very, it just felt a bit militant. Two gentlemen got up on stage and this would start what, I, I don't know what it was called, but he asked if anyone in the, in the church body needed a watchtower. And I had never heard of this before. So I rose my hand, they were out of copies. So a lady a few rows in front of me gave me hers. And I paged through it real quick, and I couldn't believe the amount of notes that she had in this thing. Like, she came prepared, and I found out why. So, uh, it, you almost can kind of think, of, and this is where I found Jehovah's Witnesses very admirable. Like, no one here was um, a spectator. You may find that in other type of churches, where you have the pastor kind of as a celebrity of the church. You have the worship team up on stage, and then everyone else is just kind of singing and listening spectating. Here, like you had to be an active participant. So you can kind of think of this like a football team. So the, the guy that was up on up front, the elder, he was kind of like the quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, American football style. He had a second in command, almost like a running back. So this gentleman at the podium, 
he would kind of direct who was going to talk. So his second in command was almost like a running back where he would read from the watchtower. And then the gentleman that was in charge at the podium, he would call on different members in the church body to expand on that. And it, um, the, the attendants, the ushers, typically I'm used to ushers, you know, giving out bulletins or passing a collection plate. The attendants here actually carried six foot long poles with microphones because with this church service, it was not just for everybody there, but anyone that may be watching in on Zoom. So they put the, the microphone in front of whoever would be called upon to expand on the watchtower message. It was just very, very different. And part of me was intimidated because I had no idea what was being talked about just due to um, the, the differences with Jehovah's Witnesses. So I was very intimidated that they would call on me to the point where it's like, I don't know what anyone is saying because I just didn't understand where it was going. The Watchtower subject was called The Kingdom is in Place. So it kind of started with, you know, do you feel uneasy about today's world events when it comes to the Ukraine war? when it comes to COVID-19, when it comes to famine and earthquakes and everything going on. So the way it was presented is this is actually a good thing because what's happening is it gives proof that through Jehovah's prophecies or God's prophecies that the kingdom is in place. What's that mean? I had no idea. So they expanded on it. So what they started reading about was Daniel's interpretation of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream from the Old Testament. And in that dream, Daniel has um, all these interpretations and, you know, feet made of iron and clay. And somehow this is where math got involved. So based off the interpretations, the last time that an Israelite king was on the throne before Babylon took it over. And this is just me, what I understood. I don't know if this is 100% accurate. The, Babylon took over Jehovah's throne in the year 607 BC. Daniel had something about seven times. They calculated that to be 2,620 years by the time that Jesus or Christ Jesus would take the throne back. So they equate that to the year 1914. So what happened in, 19, in October 1914. So what happened then is Jesus became the new ruler in heaven. And his first act as ruler was to wage war on Satan and his demons. And they won. And Satan got cast down to earth. This was an invisible war, by the way. And with Satan now fallen to earth... And with his demons, it created all more evil in the world. So you have more wars, more pestilence, more famine, more bad things in the world. And with the Jehovah's Witnesses, how they interpret that is this is fulfilling God's prophecy. This is a good thing because it shows that A, God shows his love for us by giving the prophecy in the first place, but then B, Armageddon is drawing close. The kingdom is in place. I think that's it. So I got a little bit more confused later on because then they started talking about Nebuchadnezzar's dream again with, the, with that statue, the feet of iron and clay. So those are two substances that don't mix well. So uh, they correlate that to the First World War because when Satan was they did the calculation when Satan fell to the earth in 1914. That's also when World War I started. So again, more wars, more deaths, more famine, more earthquakes, more bad. And from that, um, the iron and clay is supposed to symbolize the Anglo-American alliance, the United States and Great Britain being allies, I think. And that's, so that expanded to the League of Nations, which now has become NATO. So in Revelation, there's a mention about eight kings and ten kings. 
So that goes back to the Babylon the Great imagery from Revelation 17, where this beast is supposed to symbolize, again, false religions being cor basically corrupting the world powers, creating all this more chaos, showing that eventually Jesus is going to need to wage Armageddon to finally rid the universe of Satan. Um, I, th I think that's it again. After service, I talked to a couple different people. And I, again, I thought I was going to be um, really warmly welcomed as a visitor, but I didn't really get that vibe. And I think what happened is when I'd be talking to uh, some of the members, I would mention, you know, I visit a different church each week. And I almost sensed like this little kind of shift in... Um, shift in perception of me when I said that because so much of this service was about false religion. So if I mentioned I came from another church, I couldn't help but feel like maybe they're associating me with a false religion because one of the questions I had from this is define false religion. Is it other Christian churches? Is it the Catholic church? Is it Islam? Is it Buddhism? Like what define it? Is it any type of religion that's not Jehovah's Witnesses? Um, I think one of the other questions I had uh, for some of the members is where, you know, where's the Christ, you know, where's the cross? Where's the crucifix? And from the answer I got is it doesn't sound like they believe Jesus physically resurrected from the dead, only spiritually. So for me, I was having trouble trying to connect what was being said, because with Revelation, that was written by John. If I understand this correctly, John also wrote the Gospel of John and also the letters 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. So John talks about the resurrection. He talks about doubting Thomas and how he wanted to make sure that with Jesus having risen from the dead, like it was actually him. So it, it, I, I'm trying to figure out, okay, there's this belief about John with Revelation, with the prophecies from that. Why is Jesus' resurrection um, not looked at? One thing that I'm kind of wondering with this too is in the Bible, it talks about how the time period between Jesus died and the time that Jesus was resurrected, and I'm trying to use this as a, a timeline here, um, it kind of in the middle here, you had disciples that were a bit depressed because they thought Jesus was supposed to be this great warrior, this great Messiah that was going to rid the world of Rome. And Jesus, with his death, kind of completely flipped that narrative. So with this service with Jesus, it, it, it's the first time I've heard in a church body where it kind of envisions Jesus as this great warrior, this great, um, you know, beat him up kind of general commander like. And I totally got that vibe from this service because it was very militant. The hymns, the songs, it had that marching vibe to it. Uh, so it was a very, this was not what I was expecting at all walking in. Uh, I think uh, after this visit, as a first time visitor, uh, I'm trying to, um, like I don't align with the beliefs, but I guess one of my big questions is why is there so much uh, importance put on Nebuchadnezzar's dream? Um, why is there so much more importance put on Revelation? I didn't see a whole lot about the Gospels. It was so much more about those visions and imagery and kind of connecting the dots. Even last week with my video to the cross in the woods, like I was poking fun at myself at the end because like I'm like doing my editing. I'm like, I sound like I just like Scrooge McDuck after deep diving into a giant bowl of uh, Cocoa Puffs with how cuckoo I was sounding. Because I was just correlating and, and it's like, I don't expect every anyone or everyone to believe what I'm saying. Like, I'm having a hard time believing what I'm saying. Um, with this, like, for me, it, it's a challenge to kind of see how a dream from Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament correlates to World War I. Um, that's, that's such a leap for me. Um, so if you're a Jehovah's Witness, if you want to be brave enough to comment... Uh, I love to hear it because, it, to me, just walking in as a first-timer, uh, I can't imagine every service is like this. So tell you what, that's going to wrap up uh, this week. Uh, if you want to stay up to date for future visits, hit the like button and subscribe. 
Uh, as always, if you want to check out the first 52 churches in 52 weeks, uh, it's on Amazon. Uh, links are always in the, the description box below. So until next time...